Hey everybody, Bobby Medina here, bringing you guys uh, another exclusive interview here. I'm here with my good friend, Paul Barron, Thanks. and our esteemed guest today is someone uh, I've known since way back in our days at Disneyland. Uh, and this guy's an amazing trumpet player, an amazing musician. First call LA, he's played in all the movies, all the TV shows, played with everybody. Uh, I don't need to, uh, I don't, we don't have time to list everybody he's worked with, but he's a fantastic recording artist in his own right and a band leader, uh, highly sought after uh, clinician as well. He's a Yamaha artist and uh, endorses uh, GR mouthpieces as well. The one, the only Wayne Bergeron. Great to have you here, Wayne. Thank, oh, you, thank you, Bobby. And hey, Paul, man. It's great to hey. see you guys, of course, man. And uh we do go back a ways, don't we? <laughs> yeah, it's been a few years, so. Were you in the Toy Soldier Band? I was. Yeah, I never did that gig. Thank God. I know, you were You were in the fanfare, I yeah. think. Uh, no, I, no, I was in the Royal Band, which the was- The Royal same Band, out, that's right, okay. Same, out, same purple tights, you know, but. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, do you have pictures from those days? I do, I do a matter of oh, fact. Yeah. But, but I gotta tell you, man, those, you know, a lot of people that worked at Disneyland, you know, you know, hated it, you know, but I look back at all my times there, man, it's nothing but like fun, man. I had yeah. a great time just meeting so many wonderful musicians, you know, yeah. it was, it was incredible. All the players I met there, I mean, so many of us still work together to this day, you know. Absolutely. So it's, uh, it's, uh, Is that where you met uh, George Graham first? Well, not, and he wasn't at Disneyland, no, but I, I met, jo the first time I met George Graham was at uh, LA City College. There was a, a night band there. And they had all these local pros, and uh, and I got called to sub, and I didn't know what it was. I just knew that this guy Woody James had had this band, and I get there, and the trumpet section is George Graham, Buddy Childers, and Connie Condoli. Wow. And I'm like 19, and uh, and I mean it's all these and Pete Chris Lee and all these like you know the best players in town, just the kicks band that they played in for, and it's the first time I'd ever heard George play or Buddy or or Connie. And man, I, it, that night I remember like it was yesterday, man, because it was like this learning experience. Because I was working at Disneyland a little bit at the time, doing some stuff, and uh, maybe I was 20. And uh, and all the players in Orange County out there, they played a little differently. And they, you know, my rep at the time was, oh yeah, well he just plays really loud and high. You know, he doesn't. He plays too loud. Like he doesn't blend. I mean, I had this rep of amongst the uh, amongst the elitist Orange County players. You know that who are um, you know doing nothing now, <laughs> but that's a whole other <laughs> master class for another. another day, you know? uh, and then I heard George Graham play, and so I took that very seriously. I always tried to conform to the way players played, and I tried to, I was trying to be better. I, I I can take criticism, you know, you know, round ourselves out, and there probably some truth to what they were saying, you know. So uh, then I heard George Graham play, and I'd never heard anybody play the trumpet so loud. And then Buddy played lead, and I was like, man, they were just like, they were burying me. It sounded like I had a straight mute in. <laughs> and, I, and I realized, I go, wait a minute. These people in Orange County don't know anything. <laughs> this is <laughs> what it's supposed to sound like, you know. So I started patterning myself after that type of playing and, and going after, you know, uh, just in, interesting, you know, different areas, you know, the way they think music should be played. And not that it was bad or just different. And so I, you know, I, George and I became very good friends, not right after that, but years later, we, we started playing in bands and he's responsible for getting me in Bob Florence's band and, and on some many gigs that I got on because he had a little bit of faith in me, you know, and, and, uh, and, you know, as Paul can tell you, George Graham was our Ar Arnie Tchaikovsky. Right. Yeah, I heard him play at some club in Orange County one time and uh, it was just with a quartet or so. I think he was, I think it was just a trio behind him and he was pretty loud, you know? Yeah, but he could but play beautiful. I mean, George exactly, beautiful, beautiful, exactly. Beautiful, 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 what a sound. And, he, oh, yeah. and, and George was a, a nice jazz player, you know, because he, when he was on Cy Zettner's band, he played third trumpet and Arnie was the lead player and they were roommates and drinking buddies, obviously, you know? <laughs> and George told me that because of Arnie, it's how he learned to play lead because he said that, you know, George said he played kind of pointing down a little bit. He was kind of a downstream type player. And he would ask Arnie, hey, Arnie, man, I want to get some more chops. He couldn't play above a high D, you know. And Arnie said, well, I got to get your job, man. You got to get your, you know, and showed him some stuff. And George started taking to it. And George ended up, you know, becoming this great, great lead trumpet player and, and very much sounding like Arnie because you could tell the influence 
was there in the note length and in the style and where they put the time and everything. I mean, they, if you listen to old Bob Florence and, and an old, you know, Boss Brass, it's the same lead trumpet player. It is, yeah. You know, the way that's the length of that eighth note. Yeah. The you know, Toronto right? quarter, they yeah, call it. Yeah, exactly. And we call it a George Graham eighth note, you know. So, okay. <laughs> so you know, we're, we go, you know, which is fine too. But those guys put, you know, they put heat on the front and on the back of the note. So it went, bop. And so it had a big brick, you know. And, uh, and almost that little flip at the end, Arnie yeah, did quite a bit. And it, yeah, and it would just, you know, and, and so you could hear the influence in George's playing from Arnie, most definitely. And they, it's the same sound, you know, that big sound, kind of a darker lead sound. And, you know. they're, they're high E's, I, I swear. If you were to analyze it on a spectrograph or something, whatever it would be called, it probably looks identical. Did you make and a spectrograph? Is that a word? I'm going to look that up. I'm well, sure. I, I just made it up, but, uh, <laughs> but it, it'll it, be it always wiki. sounds so impressive, though, when he says it. Yeah, yeah. I delivered well, my it wife with is. a lot she of confidence. She makes up stuff. And well, I, let me check I, my spectrograph here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Wasn't I, he a character in the James Bond movie or yeah, something? spectrograph. <laughs> so anyway, uh, you know, that's, you know, I, I didn't meet George at Disneyland, but I, I, you know, I met him later. I met a lot of great players at Disneyland, though, you know, Andy Martin and, and, uh, Players that I still work with, you know, uh, you know, Sal Lozano, Eric Marienthal, a lot of players that Robbie knows, you know. Yeah, Don people. Clark was Don down Clark, there. Yeah, Don, another Don fantastic this, triple player. Same cancer thing I went through. Different. Is that the basically. same one? Wow. He, he had to do what I did for a year. But Don Clark is an unsung hero from Orange County. I mean, he really was a great. Oh, he's absolutely. Still great. He was a great lead player and a great jazz player. And I did a lot of uh, bands with him, man. And he was the most swinging, just like. And he had a co he had a day gig. He was a copier repairman. And yeah, I remember home. that. God, I used to. We, and then we used to play with him at the Orange Coast, one of the Orange Coast college yeah. bands, and uh, you know, around you know, different casuals and things, and just stellar musician. He would he would have been a contender if he would have taken the risk and le and left the day job. He just wanted the security, so he just played for fun. And he worked at Disneyland, you know, seasonally. And he, but man, you talk about a really great lead player, man, swinging. Yeah. Who, man, what a feel. We played in this guy, Bill Elliott's band together for years. And Bill Elliott wrote music from the 30s and 40s, but original music, you know. And it was just like, it was a really great little band. We did several CDs together. And we played on some movie source cues together, you know. And Don was the second trumpet player and the jazz player. And Daryl Gardner was the third player who Bobby knows is a really yeah, yeah. solid, great yeah, lead yeah. player, you know? And man, and this band was cooking, man. I mean, like old style. I mean, and Bill's very particular about the style and the time and and we play like that, you know? We don't just phone it in. And Don, man, would just, you know, he'd play these breaks, man, at the band, he'd go, and he'd go, he sounded like Ziggy Elman, man, and just like, cool. just come in, just like killing it. And I mean, I'm a, he, one of his hugest fans, man, but, but, uh, yeah, so many, many great players came from, from that scene out there, you know. So uh, so Disneyland was a, a good training ground for me, for sure. Uh, as far it as was. And so did that, did that have any effect on you getting into the studios, meeting people there or, you know? Not, not really. You know, I, I mean, I started doing some other work and I started subbing in the other band. I ended up being in the Disneyland band at one point. You know, I started and I worked around Orange County and I wasn't doing anything gigs that were earth shattering you know or anything i did a couple of road gigs and and uh and things i think getting off the road with maynard in 86 so i'm like 27 or at this point i think that i came back and worked at disneyland some seasonal work again after that and and my reputation I was like oh he's been playing lead with maynard and and uh and i think that helped my my reputation a little bit and uh i was playing some different i started subbing in some bands and bob florence's band when they needed somebody and and i think those things led me to those upper echelon players that were doing the work like George mm -hmm. Graham and Warren Looning and, and uh, Larry Ford at the time who was still alive uh, playing in Bob Florence's band and Steve Hufstetter and Charlie Loper playing Lee Trombone and and I think getting getting in those situations and being heard by those players that are doing the work you know is where the recommendations come from so my fr I'll just tell you a story about my first movie day because it's a, it's a funny story. I was just going to ask you about that, actually, this yeah, point. So, so the, the first kind of big movie I did with a big orchestra, you know, with A-list you know, players was this movie called Another Stakeout. And it's, you know, 30-something you know, years ago now. 
and uh, and Warren Looney and George Graham, who both worked for Joe Soldo, who's a contractor, who's 95 now or 94, he's still working. You know, it's amazing. Um, the, he'd gone through his whole list of players, and they needed another trumpet player, and so he they asked, you know, they asked George, you know. Hey, can you? I need a I need a player. And Warren said, Oh, you know, yeah, we play with this guy Wayne Bergeron, and he subs in Bob Florence's band, and solid player, you know. And I got to be friends with those guys a little bit at that time, you know. So Joe, so I get the call because we're coming for a couple of days of you know work on this thing, and I remember coming in there being really nervous, and it's like an 89, 90 piece orchestra, and and four trumpets. And I'm playing. And I've never been so terrified to play four trumpet in my life. And Arthur Rubenstein was the con composer. And he's a real hard ass on the podium. He's a yeller. He's screaming about shit all the time. And it's like, it's like really intimidating. Not at us, but just like, I was so fucking there. And nobody's fucking up. I'm sorry, I shouldn't be cursing. Nobody's screwing up. <laughs> uh, you know, nobody's making a mistake. And so I'm going, okay, don't play on arrest. Don't play on arrest. <laughs> you know? So anyway, we get, we get through it. I kind of get my composure. And it wasn't that difficult, you know, but I, I got through it. It was really fun, you know, and exciting for me, of course. And I was kind of beaming and in awe and you know being a fanboy to all the players I was playing with so it was Malcolm George Warren and me wow and uh <laughs> and so after the sessions were over I went to Joe Solo and I turned in my paperwork to get paid my my forms you know and then uh he said uh I said man thank you for the opportunity I go man this was like just so awesome he goes oh yeah everybody said you did a really great job and and I thank you I thank glad you were available I go yeah me too you know and uh and he goes I'm gonna put you on my list I'm like, oh, man, God, that's very kind. He goes, I'm going to put you on the bottom of my list. And then he kind of laughed. And he goes, you want to, you want to know why I'm going to put you on the bottom of my list? And I said, yeah, I guess I'd like to know that. <laughs> and he goes, well, of all my players here that I've been using for the last 30 years, who should I fire? Who would you like me to fire so I can put you ahead of them? And I kind of laugh. I go, oh, of course, that makes perfect sense. I go, I go, I'm honored to be on the bottom of your list. And he goes, don't worry. He goes, as they die, piss me off, or retire, you'll move up. <laughs> and I go, and I now play first trumpet for Joe Soto. So all that happened. Yeah. <laughs> they all pissed him off, retired, or passed away. And so I slowly <laughs> moved up his list. And so we're, you know, I did many, many sessions. He always contracted for Pat Williams. And so I did, you know, the last, you know, 15 years of Pat's life, I played first trumpet on, on most everything he, he did for singers or whoever. And, and, uh, and so that, those things led me those little recommendations led me into a lot of, I mean, it wasn't like I started doing a bunch of movie work right after that, but at least I was on the, I was on the map now, you know, as somebody that maybe they needed somebody, you know, the recommendations were coming through. And that's, and I think that's how you get in the business, you know, as you guys know, uh, there's players that come and go here in LA, you know, somebody, you know, composer's nephew may come in and, <laughs> You know, they yeah. want to put him on fourth trumpet and you got to just deal with it, you know, but maybe he doesn't do a good job. And so they're not going to get, you know, the players are in now, this person's not qualified or, you know, too green or, or whatever. And, and that's not good for that player to be put in that situation before they're ready either, as you both yeah. know. You know, you got to, when preparedness meets opportunity, you know, and there's a lot of players that have come to, through through here over the years that I've watched with, with, uh, with big reputations. They came from UNT or whatever, you know, these great players and, you know, but they get here, maybe they're not quite right for everything, you know, possibly, or, and uh, and they're they're kind of flash in the pan, and they come and go. You never see them again, and you kind of wonder what happened. Um, or they talk a big game. You know, anybody talking a big game. My thing with that is, you hear somebody talk when you talk about how great they are. You know, they go, "Oh yeah, man. Well, I did this, man, and yeah, and I nailed that gig, man. I nailed this high G, man, and you know, you know, well, you that lets you know right there that there's some insecurity about their abilities. You know, so they've Absolutely. got to talk. There's, and, and, and George Graham told me this. I also he goes, "There's a there's a fine line between getting discovered and found out." You know, a great and, line. That's a great saying. Yeah, yeah. And you, just, you know, you don't have to say a word. You can be a mute. And when you play your horn, it's it tells everybody everything they need to know. Whatever yeah. you're doing, you know, maybe it's something you're great and you get to this and you're not good at it. You know, everybody's going to know. You don't have to say, oh, yeah, I'm really great. Listen to this. They're going to know as soon as you play. Well, I remember getting back to what you were saying about maybe not being ready, but Shu telling me many years ago, and, and not just me. Uh, I've no, I know other people that he's tell, told us to, too. You know, you only get one chance to make a good impression. So make sure you're ready at the time, you know, when you start trying to get 
get into different areas because if you're not, you'll be found out right yeah. off the bat and you won't get a chance to get in again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you could be, you know, you could, you could dig your own grave that way, you know. I think it's good if you're in a situation where you're not sure or you don't feel as comfortable, you have to lay low and just do the best you can do, you know. And uh, I mean, let's face it, most people getting in that situation are going to be a pretty competent player. But you got to lay low and you got to keep your mouth shut and you got to go in and, and you want the players to like you. I mean, you want the players around you to feel like you're trying and, you know, I always w went in, you know, in the section, man, and my job was to make the first trumpet players sound as great as they can sound and make them comfortable. You know, Paul, you know, here is a, even though usually when he would come through town with the show, he played first because he was traveling with the show. Uh, when we came through with Aladdin, because we were there for three months, um, but because of the union rule, uh, they had to use locals, but Paul has a 47 card, so the contractor asked me, he goes, hey, you know, Paul Barron, would it be okay if we put him in the section? I go, yeah, Paul's a friend of mine, of course. You pissed probably a couple of players off in town, but that's, that's fuck him. I mean, it's just the way it goes. I mean, it's just the way it goes sometimes. You have a card here, you're welcome to work. If the conductor would like to have you there, you know, fine. So, and Paul and I being friends, so Paul played second to me. And Paul was, you know, uh, he could have had an attitude about it, said, well, I know this book, you know, I've been playing this book for six months. But Paul came in and played second trumpet man and was the most supportive second trumpet player and played perfectly under me at all times. He could sense if I was having chop problems. He knew when to get out of my way. He knew when he could lean in, you know, all of that. You know, I, I sense all that from you when you play. And Rob was the same way, you know, third trumpet player. So that makes a good trumpet section and when players are aware of what the other player is going through. And, uh, you, well, you know, you could have just buried me. So, well, now it goes like this. You know, but I went through, as you remember, I went through, I was having a little bit of lip problems at one point in the show. I was having to play a bigger mouthpiece. My lip was so swollen. And, uh, but we made through and it all, it was all fine. So being that good section player. Well, it's like you're part of a ball team, you know? I mean, you're all supposed to be playing together. It's really, I don't know what it is sometimes. It seems like when you do get into the upper echelons, when you play with people that are really competent, it's no longer like this competitive thing. It is the more issue of a goes team away. spirit. Yeah, exactly. The issue goes and, away. I mean, it, it exists. You know, the problems exist at the higher level, too, to, to some degree sometimes. There's, let's say with the trumpet comes, you know, when you play a loud instrument, you play drums or trumpet, I mean, there, there, there's some, that's a confidence versus ego thing. You have to be confident. You know, you got to, you have to be able to, to lay it down confidently, but you also have to know your role uh, of the situation, you may feel like I can do a better job playing first on this particular thing than the person that's actually doing it. But that person's not going to suck. You know, we all got the stuff that we're really good at, and we all, you know, we're all pretty versatile, but we've got our strengths. I told Paul this story. We were chatting about this the other day, and I was invited to go um, to go see a recording a session a long, long time ago of Chase Revisited. And it was really fun. I think I was in high school, maybe I was in college. And I went with some friends. Uh, uh, and we went <laughs> as a guest, I think, of Excuse Walt me. Johnson. I think I was with, with Rich Wetzel and another buddy of ours from, from high school. And we went to this session. And I remember just this incredible playing. And I, I think that uh, Bob O'Donnell was playing lead on this particular piece. And I re remember there was like this big high A, high A thing going on. And I remember him st stopping in between the takes and he says, you know, the A's not quite in there, in there today. And uh, somebody, he says, can somebody else do it? Oh yeah, yeah, no problem. And somebody else took that line or whatever, nailed the A, there was no questions asked, just move on. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I've passed parts to, you know, I've been in, uh, I did this record for Amy Grant, you know, the singer, and uh, Pat Williams had done all the charts while I'm playing first trumpet, but it was more, it wasn't so big bandy, it was very light big bandy, everything was bucket mute, and kind of a lighter session, and, but all jazz for the most part, and then on one of the cues that came up, there was this trumpet solo, you know, like 12 bars long, and kind of written intervallic thing, and and I was looking at this, I go, this is this kind of an interpreted, you know, jazzy thing. And I'm looking at it, but it's kind of big intervals going like, bo, bo, ee, dee, bo, dee, dee, oh, you know, like something, is this like a milesy thing or what is it? And so I'm kind of looking around, I'm looking at the string parts and I see nothing but whole notes. And the trombones have pads and 
and I see it's cued in the second trumpet part as well. And I start looking at this, I go, this is, and Tim Morrison was playing second trumpet at the time when he was still playing here, you know. And, and, uh, and we started this thing, I go, hey Tim, why don't you play that cue? I go, I'll play the 2D stuff and you play, you play that little solo. And as soon as we started, man, I was like, it was his thing, man. It was like, boom, boy. It was like born on the 4th of July. And I was like, it was like that yeah. stuff, you know. And, uh, and he, you know, sounded beautiful on it. And I remember one of the trombone players turned around and goes, man, either you're the dumbest person ever or the smartest, you know, for, <laughs> for giving that up. And I could have played it. You know, I couldn't play it like him, you know. I, I, could, I could have been, if he wasn't there, I would have played it and it would have been fine. And, but it wouldn't have sounded like that. I mean, it's you know, right. glorious, you know, just beautiful. But then I remember on the breaks as it was press there and, you know, video going on. And then, you know, he's getting pictures with Amy Grant. I'm going, hey, wait a minute. That's supposed to be me. Damn it. <laughs> 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 but uh, it was just one of those moments where it, that was what needed to be done. Hey, yeah. what's that saying, uh, Wayne, that you told me about? It? Yo-yo or something like that when you're going to pass a part? Uh well, I don't remember. Uh, oh, okay. But, uh, I thought thought you told me a story that it started like with uh, Conrad Gazzo and Yuan Bracy and those guys. And oh, well, Yuan always said yo about everything. Yo. <laughs> oh, is that what it was? Okay. Yeah, but but Yuan just said yo about everything. You know, so that was his catchphrase, yo. You know, but uh, uh, you know, we pass parts around, and and uh, like I said, those guys helped me out on these minions sessions the other day because I wasn't quite ready to play it was some hard music you know and, and thank god john lewis and rob shear there and tom Hooten played uh the fourth trumpet on, on this particular thing uh, what and, a sound he's got man unbelievable yeah. and uh it says my internet is unstable but i'm still here okay no you're still I'm here. unstable my internet is stable <laughs> well <laughs> you know i didn't i didn't want to make this you know go there but you know since you're talking about your issue uh with this cancer that you've gone through here and we're we're all really really happy you're you're on the mend and you're doing good again i i can't express that uh, enough on my end but you know this group uh it's primarily uh, trumpeters 50 plus you know and people there's a lot of people on it that have gone through it that are going through issues and things like that and some serious uh, you know complete body things dental things uh, as a result of it. But uh, just to give some more hope and to let people know, I mean, what's, you know, how do you get through something like this mentally? And how did just briefly, how did you come back to it on the horn? Maybe you can explain how much time you took off and how you got back. Yeah, I'll just give you, give you the quick version of the story so we don't get too long winded about it. But, but uh, uh, I, I was diagnosed in March and uh, you know, it freaked me out, of course, you know, and I started losing weight immediately. I started my treatments on May 11th, my first radiation, my first chemotherapy. I did three chemos, three weeks apart, so the very strong chemos, because they last for three weeks, and then radiation five days a week for 35. Uh, and you can see my mask right there. That's my, uh, my little prize, my consolation prize I got out of this deal, you know. Um, I got really sick, as I mentioned to you before we started this thing. I got really sick the first week from the chemo, so I trumpet became a lot less important to me and I kind of just stopped I didn't feel like playing so I kind of and I didn't have no work it was the beginning of the pandemic so I didn't really have to, anything to keep my chops up for so I quit playing for a few weeks maybe not maybe maybe three weeks and then when I did my next chemo they adjusted my medication I didn't get so sick uh so I kind of started playing but that at that point radiation side effects were starting to kick in because the tumor was here so they're radiating my my head here you know and uh so my throat was getting a little bit sore and it did get to the point where eating, even though I never got a feeding tube or any of that stuff, I managed to eat through all of this. Um, it got to where it was like swallowing glass at one point, like the worst sore throat you've ever had that never went away for a long time. So it was pretty, pretty difficult, but I played and I, what I would do when I started playing again, I just, I played soft and I would, uh, I did Clark one and two every day. And I could, at that point, I could only get to a G on top of the staff because my chops had gone south from not playing for three weeks, but also because my throat was hurting and was getting tight. So I just kind of played what I could play and I worked on my fingers and started experimenting around with some stuff that might make this better and just trying to make good use of my practice time. And then like I'd mentioned earlier, just keeping keeping the reeds working, you know, our reeds here. So if they're not, if you're not blowing air through them all the time, you know, and <clears throat> making them vibrate, 
uh, they're going to just like a bad clarinet read. If it just sat there and got dried out and all funky, it's not going to respond very well. So we have to, you know, as you you're trumpet players, you know, we have to keep at this, this thing. So I did that every day, and I think that really, really helped. Uh, now that I'm on the, I'm two months out of my last treatment, and I'm, uh, I'm coming back, and I can get up to a high G again, you know, and, and uh, I'm just starting to get where I can get over that break to the A and stuff. And, and it's not my chop so much at this point, but I think I was so scared of pain from playing that I'd go up there and I would tighten up and it would keep me from being able to get the notes. Like the panic of like, this is going to hurt or it's going to feel uncomfortable, and which it did, let me tell you. It's like uh, it's, uh, it's your throat sunburn and raw. It's like it's been out in the sun every day for two months. And so there's scar tissue and things in there. And, and, uh, and then when you stretch, like imagine having a wound on you know, a sensitive part of your body, on the inner, your inner thigh or something, like a big open cut, and then stretching it. Mm, yeah. What that's going to feel like. Well, that's going on in the throat. So even though maybe I'm not doing any damage. but So anyway, that's, that's kind of how I approach this. And I, I've become very uh, regimented in how I practiced, especially recently. I kind of do the same thing. Every day I start, uh, I'll show you one quick thing. I don't, I don't know if you know the name Burnett Dillon. Sure. But oh, Burnett yeah. Dillon played first trumpet in the Pacific <laughs> Symphony and I played in the Long Beach Municipal Band with him. And he was really, did a lot of film work here. So he was a great, great trumpet player. And his wife, Louise de Tullio, played on every film you ever heard. She was a top call flute player in town here. Well, I took a little lesson with him on Zoom the other day, you know, because I was just talking about, and he made me do, so he made me buy this mute. This is Dennis Wick, Practice Mute, which is the worst piece of crap Practice Mute ever made. I mean, Dennis Wick has made some great mutes. This mute is not a great mute. I'm just going to put it out there and say it. All those other mutes are great. <laughs> it's quiet, but he had me get, he goes, buy this, and then we're going to do a Zoom thing. And then he made me, he would make me, because this mute does not respond. I mean, it's the worst. I mean, trying to get this thing to like respond, so he'd make me play, try to get a second line G without the tongue and come in from nowhere. It's really hard to do because this thing does not respond. You have to force, but you keep at it and you get this smaller and smaller. And then once you've got it, you crescendo until, and the mute will resonate at that point. You got to put it up. But if you can get it started with nothing, and you crescendo to what you think is fortissimo, you know, and it, which doesn't take that much, and it's because you hit the, the top volume, this it stops you. And he was saying, he goes, that's really your pianissimo and your fortissimo. That's how much we overblow. Mm, that's and, interesting. Uh, and he said, you will never ever, if you can do this in this mute. You will never, ever, ever have trouble coming in on a soft entrance with the horn open. Wow. So, uh, so he said, do, so I would do this for like 15 minutes. That's what, what I do every day. I'm mean, barely blowing, and I've got, I, man, I, when I first started with him, I was like, because <laughs> you know, I'm just overblowing everything. So I do that, and then when I open up, the response is like, boom. It's like swinging two bats. Wow. wow yeah, like so, the donut. So a, of, so a lot of people will say practicing in a mute is bad, which I would say if you did it for prolonged, like the Yamaha Silent Brass, which I think is a great mute, but playing in it for an hour is a false sense of security. This you just do for a little while, and it's just to get the reed to respond at the, at the lowest level, the least amount of air and the least amount of force. So I've been doing that, and it's really helping. I just noticed when I go to play soft, the response is, is much more instantaneous than it even used to be before. I, so that little I, bit. I like, think you need to reach out to the WIC company right now and get an endorsement yeah. with them because you're probably going to sell I'm 100 sorry, of these I'm off sorry, this interview. I'm sorry, Mr. WIC, that I bad mouthed your mute, but <laughs> this is a difficult mute to make respond, you know, in, in a, but it's, it really served me a great purpose. No, that's cool. Yeah. That's a that's a that's a really an interesting point. Yeah. So and you know what's what's really interesting to me is that you know that you <laughs> take a take a lesson from somebody. You know, I mean, I take a, an occasional lesson from Bobby Shue or somebody here, or somebody on a there. Basis we talk yeah, about, <clears throat> and every, every so. Day. 
Yeah, so, but it just goes to show you that, you know, no matter what level of player you are, there's, we always have room to improve a little bit and to straighten things out, right? Yeah, I mean, I've been doing that my, my whole career. You know, I, I, uh, I didn't take a lot of lessons when I was young. I studied with my high school, my junior high band director, who was a very good all-around trumpet player named Ron Savitt. And I probably learned more from him about music than anybody because he always talked about trying to be stylistically diverse and be convincing in what you're playing. You know, if you're going to play Dixieland, try to sound like a Dixieland trumpet player, man. You got to be convincing. You can't just play the same way on everything, you know. Mm -hmm. and I remember him telling me that and I, you know, that's been my mantra, you know, through my entire career. I studied with Boyd Hood uh, from the LA Philharmonic uh, a bit when I went through some dental problems when I was working at Disneyland. And I learned a lot from him about different things. Uh, I took a lesson with Charlie Davis a long time ago, I remember, and Charlie and I are old buddies, and, and you know, and these are coming from different perspectives, but you get, mm -hmm. you get information that can be valuable to you out of all these things, even though they're different, and maybe they're, conf they're conflicting, uh, a f conflicting point of views on how we play, but you can, you know, in Bobby Shu, you know, who comes from another place. Right. You know, he really goes well, against the grain of the way we've been taught to play trumpet. You know? One of the things I was just going to say, one of the most important things I ever learned was from him, and which was, you know, basically just exactly what you're saying here. You know, try different things. You need to figure out what works for you, you know. Yeah, there's not one way to do this. No, absolutely you know? not. And, uh, and you can think about it however you want. You can think, well, I'm buzzing the notes or I'm resonating the notes. And it doesn't really matter as long as the end result uh, and the, the sound coming out of the bell is good. Well, I don't care what you think about, you know, uh, and, and nor do I even try to think about it. I, I, a long time ago, I, I can't remember who told me this, I said, quit trying to, I want you to resonate sound. And you on Racy used to say, every note has to have reverence. I studied with you on Racy a few times as well. But we never talked about whether we were buzzing or whatever. He would just say, produce a good sound. And we would, we would try to get response, you know, and however that, happened it, it happened you know so i don't i don't think about i try not to think about the technical aspect of what's going on too much uh is more than listening what's coming out of the bell now if i'm having an issue with an attack or, or something then you kind of you have to dive in and you got to get under the hood of the car <laughs> and figure out which fan belt is loose <laughs> and then make some, make some adjustments you know uh, uh, but until then if the car is running fine there's no reason to open that hood you know so right. that's kind of how i am uh, <clears throat> Everything when it comes a car analogy, I got to tell you, and I don't know why that is because I, <laughs> I, I come from a, a, a family of machinists and racers. My brother built race boats, and and I always had fast. So everything is a car thing to me. I always <laughs> comes the compression. Compression equals horsepower. You know, <laughs> all, of, all of those things. Now I imagine you've sitting next to all these great players like Warren Looning and, uh, um, you know, Charlie Davis and George and all that. You probably pick up things along the way. Can you? Tell us, you know, what little nuggets that you've got uh, from players like that. Oh, yeah. I mean, well, Warren, you don't get any nuggets from Warren because Warren, <laughs> his, his, you know, Warren lived in this nice home and made a lot of money and you know, played on thousands of recordings. He never practiced. He studied with Al Hurt. I don't know if you know that. He's from yeah. New Orleans. And he studied with Al Hurt. Wow. And, uh, and he was like this, you know, great kind of Dixieland jazz player. He ended up being in the Lawrence Welk Jr. Band. You know, you've seen. I have that him record. Playing, you've, you've seen him playing with Lawrence Welk and how great he sounded at 17 and 16 I know. years old. Mm -hmm. I mean, he already had it. So he was a, you know, he worked hard, but he was a very natural musician. And that's how he played. So his, his neighbors thought he was a drug dealer because he would leave with his briefcase, his Bach trumpet case, <laughs> and a bag. And they would never hear a peep of trumpet from the house. You know, and he had a Mercedes and <laughs> he lived a nice life, you know. But Warren, you know, so. We just play, you know, when we had played with him, I, I imitated the way he played. He was one of my favorite trumpet players of all time. So when I play flugelhorn, you know, his flugel style is one I happen to like, and I like his sound. And so there's a little bit of all those players you mentioned, and I think we all do this, is we take little bits and pieces of things we like and we imitate them, and we mold them all into what becomes our sound. And there's not a note I play that doesn't have George Graham in it. And there's not a note that Paul plays that doesn't have Arnie in it. True enough, you know, yeah because I just know where he comes from, you know, so, uh, but, you know, I, I admire all these different, uh, these different players, George, and, you know, I patterned my playing after him for a long time to the point where they go, oh, that was very George-like, you know, they would say to me the way I play, you know, but then I started going, well, God, I don't want to sound just like George. 
but that influence was in there. So I started putting my own spin on things. I've got a little Maynard in me, like we all do. You know, it's hard to avoid that yep. <laughs> as a triple player, having a little bit of that in there. It's keeping it under control. Well, you definitely you got to keep the governor of it, the Maynard thing, you know. <laughs> know when to use it. Yeah. Exactly, you know. When, you know. One of the most exciting players of, you know, ever, you know. Obviously. Absolutely. Yesterday well, was 14 years. That's right. Passing to the day. And uh, I remember I was at the Hollywood Bowl playing a gig, and the Dizzy Gillespie All Stars were playing at the time. They were closing the night, and I had to tell them all that Maynard just passed away because Maynard's oh, daughter man. told me. I told Frank Green and. And Slide Hampton was there, and he, they just broke down and cried. Man, you know, they're, uh, I remember that time, Wayne, because I, I was in town playing with you. You had taken the night off of Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. Oh, that's when that was. Wow. Yeah, and then we met up in some place in North Hollywood, and uh, I think you introduced me to uh, Frank Green. Oh, yeah, that's right. We, got, we hung out. That's right. Yeah. Wow. And I'm sure I there was some alcohol involved, I'm pretty sure. Well, we, we can't condone that, but there might have been one or two. Yeah. I probably had a ginger ale or something like that. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. If I remember correctly. I don't, I don't exactly remember some of the foreign balls. So, but, uh, but anyway, so, you know, all those influences uh, and getting to sit next to those players, man, it's like getting to do that. You know, you can study with somebody or you can listen to somebody play, but sitting next to somebody that does something better than you and something you realize is something you want, you go, man, I don't want to sound like that. And there's been many, many players, of course, over the years, even when I was younger, you know, that on uh, no name, you know, or not no name, but players you might not know their names. Daryl Gardner, though, was one of them. And I told Daryl this the other day, man, he was, you know, all flat. I go, no, Daryl, I mean it, man. I go, when I first started hearing you play, man, I wanted to sound like you. And Daryl has, we kind of sound alike in some ways, sound wise and stuff, you know, we have the same kind of buzz on our sound. and. And uh, and I always just admire the cleanliness of his playing and and uh, and the solidness of the way he played the notes. Man, I played some Easter Easter services with him a couple of years in a row where we were doing all this. It was kind of an orchestral thing, and then there was like this fanfare stuff that we were doing, and he was just all over it. Oh, he's great. I remember that. He's probably seventy four now, mm -hmm. like maybe seventy five. He still looks great. I you know I see him on Facebook and. But man, he's one of those players, and you and you take that, and, and it you know, and it molds you into who you are, and then then hopefully you develop your own sound, and then some other players that hear us, you might hear something I like, and they and they take the torch, and but it's all really just the combination of all those things, and right. You know, I look at I look at uh, and I like to, I like to take a lot of credit for this just because of my huge ego, but I look at somebody like Louis Dowdswell, who you you all know. And Louis is like my trumpet son. I mean, he really is because I, he was playing along with my recordings and stuff when he was young and the Big Fat Band was the first big band he ever heard. And so uh, I'm very proud that I was one of his early influences, you know, as a player. And he kind of patterned his playing after mine, it seems like anyway, you know, and he's playing my mouthpiece and my horn. And I remember emailing him and, and uh, saying, but dude, what planet are you from? And he was like 15 years old and he's just crushing this stuff, you know, these <laughs> And we got to be friends. I went back there and he did a concert in London, got to meet him, met his parents. He came out here and stayed with my wife and I, came and visited. And then last New Year's or two New Year's ago, him and his fiance, they came. And so we've become very good friends. He's surpassed me as a player and a recording engineer. He's just become this, this thing. But I hear my influence in his playing. And if you don't think that, you know, doesn't make me proud or flatter me, I, I would be lying. <laughs> I'd be yeah. Well, he sounds amazing from what I've seen, you know, But he's on, found online. his own sound now, too. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like the thing where I think he was imitating, you know, what, like we all do. You know, you hear something we like, and I'm, I'm flattered that he liked the way I played. But now I hear he's got that input, but he's got his own thing now. Mm -hmm. and, cool. And, and, uh, and he's just, you know, he's amazing, man. He's an amazing person. He's one of the nicest, especially for being as young as he is. Man, he's no ego wants to learn he's like we're, we're talking about I me mean, he wants right. he's listening to everybody man and admires everybody you know that's doing great things you know and that's uh, cool so and i think that's just the, the circle of life as a musician you know we we take the ball from somebody else and we move on and we retire we pass away or whatever and somebody else takes that torch and and all those things are still involved though and that's why it's a, not to get long-winded but that's why it's really important to know where the music comes from to have one foot in tradition and have one foot in the future. 
Because if you don't know tradition, and you don't know where it comes from, you might become this, but you're missing, if you're starting here, you're missing a big part of where this person you're picking up from, where they got it from. You're exactly. just picking up a piece of the puzzle, you know, instead of the whole puzzle. So, uh, you know, I think it's really important to understand the history of where the music of our instrument comes from. And, and I think stylistically, too, like I've never wanted to be a parody of, you know, if I'm playing right. something that's sort of Dixieland like, I don't want to be playing it in such a way that I'm making fun of it or a parody of it. I want it to be traditionally correct and, yeah. and, it, you know, and pay respect a, to that music. There's a fine line uh, with that stuff, especially when it comes to somebody like, like Maynard. And we'll use him because he's a good example of this. Maynard was a really, you know, he had an odd way of playing, which was, you know, especially later, you know, in his career. Early on, I mean, he had his own style. You could hear Maynard, you know, you, you know, he's one of those players, two notes, that's Maynard Ferguson. Whether he yeah. was playing lead or playing a solo or whatever, the, the buzz in his sound, the, the style of his shakes, you know, all the stuff he did. But then later, you know, he became, you know, he came, became this wild, he became like a rock guitar player where everything went, wow, you know, he just became this, this thing, you know, where everything was kind of uncentered and, and, uh, and shaking, and, but it was exciting, you know, and it was just what he did. But he's really the only one that could get away with that. Because when I would hear other people imitate him to a T like that, the only one that ever did it with respect that I heard, there's a couple of people, L uh, Lars Lundgren. The guy oh, yeah. Who, he did a Maynard thing, man. And, and he's he, a member it, here. He's a member here on, in the group. He really, he did this record, man, and it really sounds good. I mean, he's really paying homage to Maynard without being too over the top you know with it and it's really great and eric eric me yeah. oh, yeah. i give them a free pass because eric's made you know he made a career out of out of doing this you know which he kind of regrets he's kind of you know he's sick of doing being maynard you know, he, <laughs> he's eric Miyashiro, man he brings his own shit to the table absolutely you know? absolutely and, uh, and so but he's really you know done it right i've always kind of shied away from even maynard tributes and things like that because i'm i don't want to be compared I don't, I'm not going to ever play MacArthur Park the same way, man. I'm going to play it how I yeah, play it with some major exactly. And I, and I, and I, you know, I can't play it the way he played it, and it's it's him. But yeah. the influence is there. But with him, if you you know, it's such a cult following. If you do something different, you know, they're all over you and they're criticizing. Oh well, you know, well, Maynard didn't, you know, he didn't breathe that I well. Know, but that's that's because, silly because he's a giant lung. You know, we're not yeah. all, you know, we don't all have that, you know, we have to, but, but that happens a lot. And, uh, and I don't take it seriously, but I, I just don't put myself in that situation. As a matter of fact, when somebody goes, Hey, do you want to play Rocky? I go, well, that's going to cost you an extra two grand. <laughs> <laughs> now, occasionally I will do, you know, if a band director really wants to do MacArthur Park or something, I'll do it. Cause I enjoy playing that. I mean, I guess I think that's just, it's one of those pieces that holds up to the test of time. It's a great song. Yeah. The arrangement absolutely. is like a built in exciting, you know, great thing to play. And, and am I sick of it? Oh God. Yes. I'm sick of it, but <laughs> it's still kind of fun to play, you know? Yeah. But uh, do I want to do that all night or do a Maynard tribute and do 20 Maynard two? No, I can't. And I, I don't want to try. I'm 62 years old now. I'm way old for your group even. <laughs> no, no, you're not. 16 over group. Um, <laughs> you know, and I just don't want to work that hard anymore. I mean, I've still got plenty of chops and stuff. But I just want to kind of do what I do and, and know what I do and know my place and know my strengths and, uh, and how I can get through a concert when I do a concert. You know, how many tunes I can play comfortably and get through it without folding. You know, even Maynard, you know, when he would play, you would watch him. He didn't play the whole time. He would play and then he'd rest and he'd let Cat stretch it so he could rest. Yeah. So even Maynard, you know, with his invincible chops, I mean, he was smart enough to know he had to pace himself through a gig, you know, and then exactly. we, we do these Maynard things. And they go, well, we want to bring in, we can't want you to do Gospel John, MacArthur Park, Maria, da 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 da, Pocahontas, give it one. They want you to do like eight Maynard charts in a one person. And those are charts where there's, it's just nonstop playing for each tune and they don't understand that. It's yeah, you're going to be on your impossible. teeth after the third one, yeah. It's physically kind of impossible for just about anybody. And I'm, I'm sure there's somebody that can go out there and do it, but, uh, you know, it's not me, I'll tell you that. <laughs> First of <laughs> to let you know, that's not me. So if you've got one of those gigs, don't call me unless there's like, four <laughs> there's four of the trumpet players doing it, I'll play a couple of the tunes, you know, and I'm in, you know, so. Well, Wayne, 
I got to say thank you so much for being here. We're just out, just about out of time. I know Paul has another uh, something else he's got to get to here he's just so a busy, second. Paul Barron, he just, uh, <laughs> but uh, we're gonna we're gonna end this thing with a with a lightning round real quick. So I'm gonna let Paul throw out the first uh -oh. question. Just t just tell us whatever comes to mind. There's no right answers. There's no wrong answers. Whatever comes first to mind. Go ahead, Paul. Okay. Uh, favorite place to visit in Hawaii. the world. Hawaii. Hawaii. Okay, Bobby. Wow. Top three, top three albums you take to a to a desert island. Um, uh, Al Jarreau, uh, Jarreau, the one with Morning on it, and that that would be on there. Uh, Stevie Wonder songs in the key of life. Uh, the trumpet ones are really hard, man. I, but. Uh, miles ahead you know i don't know that's a tough one but th those are three that i need there it's funny i'd mentioned you know two pop artists uh but no Stevie it's Wonder, not I funny they're great, is, great music is great I, I think music he's the greatest you know greatest ever he's probably my favorite artist of all time uh okay uh most memorable gig uh playing aladdin with you <laughs> <laughs> now everybody knows you're full no of i'm gonna tell you my most gig, and it, it just happened recently and it was doing that that movie i'm not supposed to talk about uh-huh uh, sounds with left side sounds like left side story <laughs> yeah <laughs> um and getting to do that uh with the new york philharmonic and and the whole experience that went along with that is really one of the greatest uh things i've done in my career well, I can't wait until that's uh, released then. Will that be a, I mean, in the COVID I comes, thing? I think it comes out in, in uh, December. So will it be like a Netflix or a No, Amazon it'll be Prime? a movie, movie. It'll be a motion picture. Oh, okay. Yeah. An actual theater release yeah, then. Yeah, an actual theater Okay, good. Steven Hopefully we can get back to the theaters again. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. But, uh, but anyway, that's, you know, I've gotten to do a lot of great things in my career, but that's, it's a thing that I just, you know, I've told Paul all about it, but, you know, just to be get to, to, the opportunity to, to do that it could have been many players that it could have been there and, and the fact that i got to do it was uh really just really exciting for me and and, uh, and later in my career man getting to do something that means so much you know and, and also at, Yuan, Yuan racy played for his trumpet on that and i was good friends with Yuan, and so to get in sit in his chair you know and get to play that iconic music was pretty cool and, and with Bernstein's uh, family w were there too, I yeah, think you told me. Yeah, there, Bernstein's family, Duda Mel conducting, you know, David Newman's involved, music coach John Williams, music supervisor. It was a big deal for me, you know, and, and getting to play and sit next to Chris Martin and Cats and the, the New York Phil, man. And they, and they were awesome. I felt like, you know, I, I felt like family when I was there. They treated me very, very well. Well, that's, that's awesome. And, you know, just once again, man, we're all so happy you're doing, you're doing good. You're on the mend and you are uh, an inspiration. And I mean that to, to all of us. I don't know any trumpeter who you are not an inspiration to, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, you have raised the bar and you are probably, in my opinion, one of the greatest trumpet players that have ever graced the face of this earth. You know, you well, got a thing, and it's uh, really, really great seeing you here, and thank you so much for being part of this, Wayne. My mother used to say all those same things about me, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, thank you. That's very, that's extremely kind of you, and, and uh, you know, we're not curing cancer here to, to coin a phrase. We're just playing the trumpet, man, so my advice, you know, to a lot of young players is in, or anybody, you know, I'd mentioned ego with the trumpet and stuff. It's not take, you can't really take yourself too seriously, man. Just do what you do and, you know, bring joy to people with your playing, let your playing do the talking and, and uh, realize that in the big scheme of things, the trumpet players like to think they're really, really important. <laughs> and, <laughs> and until you become sick or have some of the things happen, you realize how not important that really is. I mean, it's important, but it's, it's not, there's a lot of things that are, that have a lot more meaning in life, you know. I love yeah. playing, and I'm, I'm very happy I do what I what I do. But uh, I'm just glad that uh, I'm glad I'm alive. You know, we are too. So yes. thanks, yeah. thanks so much for being here. We're gonna have we got to have you back for part two to where we can we can continue the conversation. That would be great. I would love that. I know we got long winded about a lot of stuff, but you know, there's a lot of stuff we can talk about. So maybe you come up with some other topics. We'll go another direction. Well, and feel free to chime in on the group. I know you're a member of the group, and you're probably. I, I, a I will. I'm sorry. I've been. I'm sorry. I've been. Uh, I'm not very active with any of this stuff that much, just because. 
there's so many of them out there and I, I've, I've chimed in on a few of them, not, not on your group so much, but, but some of the other groups you chime in and then all of a sudden it becomes this like, this competitive thing and you know, everybody knows something. No, it's, it's not like that some here. Oil or something, you know, it's like, ah. You know. Uh, no, we've had, we've had some nice, nice moments with uh, Michael Sachs and Chris Gecker and some just Beautiful some people. Yeah. yeah, Tony Cadillac, some great players chiming in a little here, a little there. Tony and I think is, it is one of my favorite players of all time. I didn't really get, you know, we didn't talk about that, but. Yeah, so well, yeah, maybe what we'll do next time, Paul, is we'll do a happy hour check because we once in a while we do a happy hour chat with the guys and we'll all grab a beer. And we'll all get together on East Coast, West Coast kind of thing. Hey, I, you, know what, you know what would be fun it, uh, is maybe let's do another one of these. And I'd love to do one with Tony and I involved because we're kind of East Coast, West Coast. In a lot of ways, we do the same kind of work. We're in the Absolutely. Same, we're in the same circles. As a matter of fact, he would have been called for that movie had I not have been available because he was put on hold for it. And then I said, I feel bad, man. I knocked you out of a gig. You know, <laughs> he was cool with it, you know, of course. But uh, but it'd well, be fun to do that with him because Tony and I are good friends. I really admire his playing a lot. And uh, matter of fact, he's writing a chart for me, a matter of fact. Uh, as we speak. Well, he started it three years ago, so I'm still waiting for him to finish it. That's another, <laughs> Not to put you on the spot, about. Tony. Um, so, so maybe we can do a, it'd be really fun to do something like that if you guys yeah, do it. Yeah, Paul, Paul and I have talked about that. So we'll line that up and we'll, uh, we'll look forward to uh, seeing you on that one then, Wayne. Thanks so much for being here. Really All appreciate right, you guys. it. Paul, Thank you, Paul. Bobby, All right. Thank you, man. You really take fun. care. Take care, you guys.